Thank you, John, and my fellow plenary uh, speakers, Minister Ledeon and General Vic. Uh, it's an honor to be able to be on the session with you, and uh, it's an honor to be able to address all of you. Uh, Singapore is delighted to uh, host and facilitate this Shangri-La Dialogue. I want to thank you, first of all, for many of your positive comments on uh, the hospitality you've been receiving. In fact, uh, uh, judging from the exuberance of your comments, uh, I half believe that it was due to the quality of wine that we served in the opening dinner. In fact, a particular delegation came to me and said the wine was very good, and I'm not sure who to thank. <laughs> but nonetheless, thank you for your comments. Uh, many of you have shared how uh, you've been happy with the topics that we've discussed at Shangri-La Dialogue, that uh, they address the hot-button issues and that the interactions have been significant. And, uh, and uh, my response to them as it's now is that we are delighted to facilitate this Shangri-La Dialogue. Uh, whether the Shangri-La Dialogue is a su success is very much in part from your presence. And here I want to uh, thank uh, the support that uh, my ministerial colleagues from not only within ASEAN but outside ASEAN have given by your strong attendance, uh, especially this year from Europe and the United Kingdom, uh, but also by your contributions through the various sessions. And I would encourage you to make full use of uh, the time here. To, we know you're busy and to maximize the opportunities for your bilateral calls as well as your various uh, side sessions during the Shangri-La Dialogue. Uh, we are discussing advancing defense cooperation in the Asia-Pacific. And much has been said about the growth and prosperity of Asian nations, especially over the last two decades. Some have even dubbed this century as the Asian-Pacific century. Whatever the appellations, the virtuous effects of Asia's rise have been dramatic. Asia's growth engine was sorely needed and indeed kept the global economy in flight in the aftermath of the global financial crisis in 2008, when the US and European economies slumped. Peoples within Asia have benefited greatly from its growth, and the statistics, or some statistics, reflect this rising tide that has lifted countless boats. Three decades ago, 1.7 billion people in East and South Asia lived in extreme poverty, less than US 1.1 and quarter dollars a day. Today, the figure has been more than halved to 753 million, a lot more people, but we have made progress. According to the Asian Development Bank, three quarters of Asian economies reported youth literacy rates of 95% and above. Life itself has been impacted at least for longevity. An OECD survey of 22 Asian countries found that the average life expectancy had increased from 57 years in 1970 to 72 years, 40 years later, a stunning 15 years increase. In other words, an increase in one year, or more than one year, every three years. It is no wonder that Asia and the Oceania, with half of the world's populations, have been deemed to hold tremendous potential, poised to reap the demographic dividends from a young and increasingly educated population. This optimism extends to ASEAN, a sizable region within Asia with 600 million people, half of which are still under the age of 30. I wasn't sure whether to be excited or depressed when uh, my fellow colleague, Minister Gasman, said the median age of Philippines was 23. I, I, I dare not ponder the median age of Singapore at this point of time. But rejecting autarky under communism and freed from their colonized past, Asian nations gained independence and progress as they found common cause and value in a globalized world, interlinked through the global commons of international finance, trade, and security, which are crucial for continued stability and progress. But as many speakers before me have pointed out, there are existing challenges that could derail Asia's promise and great hope. Sustained progress of many Asian nations have bolstered their confidence and provided the means 
to modernize their economies and militaries. Many of your questions have reflected this. And the numbers bear this out. Nominal Asian defense spending has increased from US 207 billion in 2008 to 290 billion in 2012, equivalent to an annual average growth rate of nearly 9%. According to IISS, Asia spent more on defense than Europe last year. The growing confidence and resulting assertiveness of Asian countries to project both soft and hard power is an inevitable consequence of their growth and is of, and is of itself not a win-lose formulation. Indeed, the global economy depends on Asia as an engine of growth. Asian countries have also taken more active roles in the international institutions, peacekeeping operations, reconstruction, and stabilization efforts, contributing more substantively to international security. For instance, China, Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines, the Republic of Korea, Japan, India, as well as Singapore, have all deployed to the Gulf of Aden in the international fight against piracy. However, rising nationalism within individual countries can create win-lose constructs if they threaten the global commons that have provided the stability and means in the Asia-Pacific region. It is an existing threat that has already manifested itself in a number of ways, such as in matters of contested sovereignty and competing territorial claims. In the East China Sea, strong nationalist sentiments have been roused in both China and Japan over Tiaoyi and Senkaku Islands. Tensions are running high over the shooting of a Taiwanese fisherman by the Philippine Coast Guard in the South China Sea. Manila has, seen, has since been the subject of vehement protests and economic sanctions from the Taiwanese. Apart from security concerns, such incidents impede development, whether unilaterally or multilaterally. As a specific example, it would be difficult for large reservoirs of much needed gas and oil to be found and extracted given the current tensions within the seas in Asia. There have been periodic skirmishes between skip ship vessels of different countries, some of them military, in the South China Sea. It is against this backdrop of existing regional, that regional, existing regional and global networks play a much needed and crucial role to help balance rising nationalism and keep, if not expand, our global common space. Without these frameworks, individual countries risk becoming increasingly insular at the expense of common goals. Indeed, our increasing interactions in security cannot be the center or predominant focus of our cooperative efforts. I say this even as a defense minister. While we must have security cooperation, we need to premise our terms of engagement on areas of common interest in vital economic and even social domains. This is why Singapore is pushing the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RESEP, which comprises the 10 ASEAN member states and its six FTA partners. When concluded, the RCEP will be the world's largest trade arrangement, covering almost half of the world's population and accounting for a quarter of the world's GDP. Equally significant, as mentioned here, is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, another economic partnership which further liberalizes trade between economies on both sides of the Pacific. Social cultural exchanges, such as those that take place under the ASEAN social cultural community, must be enhanced to provide opportunities for stronger ties to be forged between countries. Concurrent to these efforts, the defense and security communities should do our part. Within existing fora, as we're now doing in the Shangri-La Dialogue, and in others mentioned before, like the ADMM Plus, the EAS, and the ARF, the ADMM Plus builds on the ADMM, ADMM and involves key extra-regional countries, the US, the China, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Republic of Korea, Russia, and India. For our own credibility, we in the defense communities need to achieve concrete outcomes from these various fora. I would like this morning to suggest three areas, this afternoon, to suggest three areas to focus on. First, we must step up practical cooperation, especially between militaries to build understanding, if not trust. Here, the ADMM Plus is moving boldly 
It will conduct its first joint exercise later this month, involving over 2,000 personnel from the 18 ADMM plus militaries. It will involve seven ships, 18 helicopters, medical search and rescue, and civil engineering teams. Two other ADMM plus full troop exercises in maritime security and counterterrorism will also be held this year. That the ADMM plus can move from dialogue to cooperation within a span of a few short years is a significant achievement at the political, policy, and operational levels. Second, we must together effectively tackle common security threats, which are increasingly non-traditional in scope and transnational in reach. And my colleague, Mr. Ledrion, has expanded on that. It includes piracy, proliferations of weapons of mass destruction, and natural disasters. The PSI, which Minister Ledrion mentioned, for instance, takes an action-oriented approach to interdict the illicit transfer of weapons of mass destruction, their delivery systems and related materials in a manner consistent with national and international legal frameworks. Within Southeast Asia, we have the Malacca Straits patrols, through the Mal where Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and Singapore collaborate in counter-piracy and armed robbery threats in the Straits of Malacca with positive results. The ADMM Plus has, built, has established the expert working groups to build cooperation in five common areas of common security, hum HADR, military medicine, maritime security, peacekeeping operations, and counterterrorism. We recently also include, agreed to set up an additional expert working groups on humanitarian mine action to deal with potentially destructive remnants of war in this region. Third, we need to quickly establish channels of communications, communication and other mechanisms at the operational and political levels to prevent or mitigate escalation of tensions. This was discussed at the 7th ADMM last month held in Brunei, where the ASEAN defense ministers expressed support for our leaders' commitment to work actively with China towards the early conclusion of a code of conduct in the South China Sea. There, as mentioned by my Vietnamese colleague recent, just uh, before me, the Vietnamese raised the suggestion for claimant states to enter into a no first use of force agreement. Singapore supports this idea for claimant states to enter in such agreement. This is one practical way to give effect to the principle of peaceful settlement of disputes in the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, which have been acceded to by ASEAN Dialogues partners. Brunei further proposed a setup of hotlines which quickly diffuse tensions at sea. We welcome these ideas and encourage regional militaries to see what more can be done on this front. For instance, increasing information sharing, especially between regional navies on their standing oper standard operating procedures in the events of incidents at sea. Colleagues and friends, Asia holds great promise for ourselves and the world. But continued peace and prosperity in this region are neither fait accompli nor automatic. Indeed, if we are to continue to enjoy stability and progress, we must work effectively in unison. To strengthen areas of common interest, defense cooperation can meet the challenges before us through shared principles, interests, and objectives, and above all, political will. Thank you very much.